So I'm going to talk about, uh, for a slightly shorter period of time now, where can we go on rebreathers that we can't go on open circuit? And yes, that's what we're going to talk about. So I've been diving just a little bit about me. Um, probably most of you don't, don't know me. This is my first trip to Florida. I have uh, two lives. One uh, life, I'm uh, an anesthesiologist and work uh, in diving and hyperbaric medicine. The other job that I'd like to be doing is uh, going cave diving and taking movies and, and photographs. Uh, for large amounts of time. I've been diving for about 30 years, but my passion for diving has really taken a new hold with, with the innovation of widely available rebreather technology. So what we're going to talk about is how uh, rebreathers work in exploration uh, diving, and uh, exploration usually involves an expedition to go somewhere. An expedition is defined as a journey that's undertaken by a group of people with a particular purpose. For example, uh, an expedition into the jungles of the Orinoco, there's a second shorter definition, which is that uh, it can be a short trip made for a particular purpose, like a shopping expedition, like uh, we did yesterday to the outlet malls. Now, anyone who believes that to be the correct definition of the term should immediately leave the auditorium. Uh, by definition, expeditions involve some added problems and, and complexities. They are in, by definition, remote locations. They're often hard to get to. Uh, it may be difficult to communicate to the outside world from remote locations which needs, there's a, means there's a great need for self-sufficiency when you're in these locations, and that covers all aspects of, of what you're doing there, including you know, living and sleeping and eating and cooking, but you need to also think about medical problems and disaster management planning, uh, how you're going to get a sick or injured diver out of the site should that become uh, necessary. Transportation into some of these uh, locations, uh, which I'll go on to show you, is um, often difficult as well, and often we have to travel very light particularly if you're using things like helicopters, which you, you tend to pay by, by the minute as you're uh, going into the sites. Now, this was the first video, which I'll reenact now. This is a helicopter flying into the Pierce Resurgence and landing by the beautiful river there. You get an aerial view looking down. There's a cargo net underneath the helicopter. Whoop, there it goes. They're dropping the rope from underneath. Can you see that? Yes. And uh, you'll see us unloading all the equipment, uh, four or five tonnes of equipment, into a remote New Zealand uh, river you get a sense of that. These are some of the places in, in Australia where we're uh, actively cave diving at the moment. The colours are all strange, are they? Yes, the colours are all wrong. Um, so that's a big brown country called Australia with red circles on it and a little yellow dot where I live. Uh, the big red circle, uh, which may appear to be a slightly sort of hypoxic blood stain sort of dark blue colour uh, is the Nullarbor Plain and what I was going to cunningly do with the next slide is show how Florida, this uh, amazingly uh, beautiful part of the world which is full of caves, how this is going to now, with this uh, video slide, you can see Florida, Florida up in the top right corner, that is going to magically fly down and fit almost exactly into the Nullarbor Plain. Now the point of that slide is to say that uh, Florida, which has a population, I gather, of close to about 20 million people, which is roughly the same as the, uh, the Australian land mass, about 20 million, covers an area of about 66,000 square miles. And the Nullarbor Plain is roughly the same size. It's about 77,000 square miles and has a population. Well, I tried to add up the people in the, in the few towns there, and I got to about 350 people, but there must be a couple of thousand people living there out and about. But the point being that... Not only is it a very rich area of, uh, for cave diving, it's the largest limestone slab, in the, single slab in the world, in fact, but it is truly, uh, you get a sense of real isolation when you're out there because you're in a place the size of Florida with uh, you know, only a few hundred people there. So you may be aware, we may not even get to talk about rebreathers at this rate, but you may be aware that um, between Australia and New Zealand there is a, a little bit of very friendly rivalry. And it's sad to say, but it's true to say, there are, there are many fantastic things that have come out of New Zealand. At the top of the photo there is a, a long-distance galloper called Far Lap, which is uh, widely recognised, certainly down our way, to be one of the greatest racehorses of all time. All my life I thought that was an Australian racehorse until I started doing some research for this talk. Uh, Ernest Rutherford, one of the, the, the grandfather of nuclear physis, physics at the top left, he actually came from a little town called Nelson, which is one of the great caving areas of the South Island of New Zealand. Also, I thought he was an Australian until recently. I'm still not convinced that the pavlova, that meringue and cream-filled cake on the bottom right, I'm sure that's Australian, but 
Wikipedia and all these sources tell me that it was invented in New Zealand, and so on it goes. So for, forever we're trying to claim all this Kiwi stuff as our own, but there is one exception. <laughs> all right, rebreathers. And the talk's nearly finished. We're mainly here to talk about safety, and I, of course, take all that stuff very seriously. It's important, though, to look at the other end of the envelope, some of the, stu the stuff that we're doing on rebreathers, which is uh, arguably not as safe as it, as it could be, but to, to find the limits or the envelope of uh, rebreather diving is actually very important to know because it tells the rest of us what we can safely achieve on rebreathers in the same way that open circuit divers like to swim down a shot line and pull off a peg at the deepest point and return to the surface uh, with extremely high risk for their lives. Whilst most of us would think that a foolhardy and reckless endeavour, it gives us some very important information about what the limits of uh, such diving is. And I would never encourage anyone to att attempt depth records or, or records of any kind for a record's sake. Just to look back though, when, when rebreather diving perhaps first started from a technical diving point of view, I think from what I can understand that probably a, an oxygen rebreather dive in Wookiee Hole was the first technical rebreather dive performed, recreational rebreather dive, and unfortunately probably also the site of the first rebreather death. But it was a lot easier than walking through those sumps in standard dress, I imagine. I'm very glad that I got a moment to say hello and introduce myself to Bill Stone and Richard Pyle at lunchtime before I started to talk about them and, and their contribution to this, to this sport. But in fact, this rebreather, the, the prototype Cis Luna and everything that followed really did change the way I think the world has looked at rebreather diving and Richard uh, has contributed uh, you know, equally significantly to that. And to their credit, both those guys have published so widely about what they've done with these units that we've all got to hear about it and learn about it. And certainly this, this stuff is what brought rebreather diving to my intent, uh, attention and I voraciously read everything I could about uh, Bill Stone's endeavours in particular being interested in cave diving. And just to remind you what Bill did and with the unit, and I hope I don't uh, misrepresent him at all, but at, at a point where they were exploring this very deep dry cave and had reached a sump, they had also reached the limits of open circuit diving with the, the very lightweight high pressure composite cylinders that they were carrying. And you can imagine carrying you know, scuba equipment down you know, a 1400 metre dry cave involves a massive manpower and a massive logistics. So when you finally get down to the sump, you want to have uh, every opportunity to do the maximal amount of exploration. And they had reached the limit of what they could really sensibly carry down to the sump and start diving. So Bill built this amazing rebreather, uh, which was fully redundant, in, redundant with its systems. And they uh, went on to successfully explore that sump. And uh, 600 metres of their exploration was through a sump, the depth of around 30 metres and, and the longest dive uh, over an hour and a half. And the amazing thing about that, uh, whilst that dive in itself is not so spectacular apart from the location of the dive, is that only you know, 1,400 litres of oxygen and about 2,500 litres of heliox were consumed, which is absolutely nothing, uh, a couple of cylinders worth. And I think this uh, should be compulsory reading, not just for rebreather divers, but for all scuba divers because of Bill's ability to take an engineer's approach to look at failure points and failure analysis of, of complex systems like this. And presumably he used this thought process to, to design and build his fully redundant uh, or dual redundant rebreather system. Um, now this, um, these nodal probability schematics where he looks at each failure point along the way and if one thing fails, is there a way around it? This is my doctor's sort of understanding of an engineering principle. He, he applies in this paper to every type of scuba apparatus, um, including a single tank scuba through to manifolded scubas and uh, scuba tanks and so forth. Um, now, I myself was an engineer of note, and like Bill, I took to building rebreathers in my shed also. And uh, this was the Harry Breather Mark II, which was made from a uh, a variety of uh, components from the hardware store, uh, some stolen anaesthetic equipment, and the Drag Array, which is, as we all know, the home, home builder's friend. Um, and uh, that, that performed two to three swimming pool dives before it was dismantled and the individual components hidden in various parts of the house so that it could never come together and act as a uh, complete machine again. But I feel that probably um, Martin Parker's inspiration was somewhat inspired by this unit and uh, you can probably see the design features that are 
that are similar. And Rick Stanton takes this sort of endeavour to, the, to an, another level again with his um, beautifully named uh, uh, hardware store apparatus, uh, like the bagpipes of Doom, Doom and the, another one that's called the Wing and the Prayer. Um, and actually, I, one thing I, I want to have a talk to Bill about is if he had his time again in that Mexican cave, would he take something more like this? Because he could probably put 10 of them in one bag and take them all down with him. Or would he still use a, a complex and fully redundant system like, uh, like he's done? Because something like the Kiss Rebreather, I think, has changed the way that a lot of us might think about that kind of uh, exploration. I'll have to wait till we're at the bar tonight to ask him. So just to look at some numbers, what, what have people achieved on um, rebreathers? And when I say achieved, I mean how far down have they, have they gone? Um, so this information is all from the internet, so please sing out if, if I've got some numbers wrong or if there's something that can be updated. But the deepest cave dive on rebreather at the moment was the, uh, the rebreather dive that David Shaw performed in Bushman's Hole in South Africa. Um, as we all know, the subsequent dive to the same depth um, had a fatal outcome. Uh, there was a recent um, shot line dive in, I think it was in the Red Sea by Christoph Starnowski uh, using twin hammerhead rebreathers, dual hammerheads to 283 metres. Um, the longest cave traverse uh, in this part of the world, as you all know, on a, on a passive semi-closed rebreather by the WKPP team, uh, over 11 kilometres. Um, a massive duration underwater using habitats for decompression. Uh, the longest sump is now this amazing sump in uh, Pozo Azul in Spain, done by the British uh, cave diving team with uh, John Belanthon and Rick Stanton and Jason Mellison, uh, which is over five kilometres for a single sump. Uh, the, deep, the deepest sump ever passed to air, which is actually an incredibly challenging thing to accomplish if you think about it. You're going down, 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 and then you get to 100 metres and you start going up and you're having to do decompression, at some point you have to commit yourself to keep going up and then basically repeating the whole dive if you don't reach air, or if you do reach air, you've got to you know, deco out to the surface. So the deepest sump to be passed is uh, about 100 metres, uh, which is uh, the first of four sumps in that cave that have now been passed. Um, and the deepest wreck dive, the Milano, 236 metres on uh, rebreather. So it seems that the, the 200 metre range is the range where the um, where the deeper dives are being done at this stage and there's no question that the risks uh, to the individuals um, increase exponentially at these, at these depths. So one question I'm going to ponder towards the end of this talk is, you know, what, what is the current depth limit and where will this finish up? So to just uh, look at a couple of the expeditions that I've been involved in over the last uh, few years, um, most uh, cave divers around the world have probably heard of uh, Cocklebitty Cave. It's certainly our most famous cave. It's kind of analogous to Ginny Springs in terms of how, how popular it is um, uh, to visit or, or to think about at least. Um, it's out on that Nullarbor Plain that I showed you on the, on the, map of, on the big green map of Australia. And um, it's certainly a very remote place. Nullarbor, as you probably know, stands for no trees and um, it's, uh, there's no question that it's appropriately named. Uh, that's Craig Challen standing over uh, a star dropper which marks the first uh, air chamber, which is about 800 metres, uh, which is, what, 3,000 feet into the cave. So there's three sumps, basically, with two air chambers in the middle and an overall length of about six kilometres, or a bit over six kilometres. It's a very beautiful place, despite the fact that there's absolutely nothing there, and it's like a big brown billiard table uh, I find the Nullarbor an extraordinarily attractive and beautiful place, especially at night time uh, when you get these amazing electrical storms or a uh, beautiful sky with all the stars. Um, now, this, to me, summarises why you can do things with open circuit, but you, don't, you, know, you no longer need to. And uh, if you think about the 1983 push, sorry about the colour, um, the 1983 push in which Hugh Morrison laid some line at the end of the cave. You know, the French had been, uh, the Australians had gone a little way and then the French came over and snuck into our cave and, and went a bit further and so, no, we cannot stand for that. So these guys went back the next year and uh, took as many cylinders as they could find. And one of those tanks, I'm proud to say, was my 72 litre um, aluminium tank that I bought uh, soon after my course. Um, so they, they took all these cylinders out there and uh, 
tied them all together and dragged them through the cave and used these big sleds with uh, built-in buoyancy control. And uh, over a period of time, they used this equipment and this many divers, four sleds, and um, spent 55 hours underground to add uh, a few hundred metres to the third sump of the cave. Uh, their underwater time was 11 hours and uh, they reached uh, six, just over six kilometres. Now compare that with the streamlined efficiency and uh, attractive nature of those two divers who um, uh, essentially repeated the same dive a few years ago um, without, that, uh, uh, without the need for that massive infrastructure. Um, of course, when Craig and I went back to try and add a bit of line to the end of Hugh Morrison's or actually um, to uh, Chris Brown's line, um, you know, all the hard work has been done, the line's been laid for us in front of us. But uh, regardless, we, we could go out there with um, you know, three rebreathers between us, uh, four small scooters with lithium batteries and uh, about uh, eight open circuit cylinders in the cave. Um, underwater time of about nine and a half hours and underground time only 19 hours uh, and uh, about 120 metres of line laid by Craig at the end of the cave. So yes, you can still do it on open circuit and there are, there are divers still going out there and camping in the second uh, air chamber um, and, uh, and doing all this on open circuit um, but it seems that rebreathers have perhaps changed that. Unfortunately, there uh, is a price to pay for technology and uh, whilst we were developing our own lithium ion batteries for our scooters to do these dives, we found that they're also very combustible and if you put them on the roof rack of the car and they rub together on the way home, then uh, the result is a burnt out Nissan Patrol. Uh, to the left of the screen on the floor, that, that sort of white and black smudge is a Mark 15 5 rebreather that I used to own. And there's also some nice camera equipment in small aluminium puddles on the floor there. Uh, but Ken Smith in the background, who many of you know, a regular visitor of the Florida, Florida caves, um, he, uh, he said, uh, thank God I didn't have any insurance because all that paperwork's a real pain. <laughs> so m just before I did that Cocklebitty expedition, I was lucky enough to be invited by a guy called Paul Hosey, who's a very uh, enthusiastic Australian cave explorer. Um, to visit a cave that they just found in the Kimberleys, which is in the very northwest of the whole country. And it's a, a truly remote place. There's no way to get to this site by, by road or even by foot. Um, the only way in is from a small Aboriginal settlement called Warnham uh, by helicopter. Um, helicopters are there because they take tourists to fly around the Bungle Bungles, which is that sort of beehive range, as you may have, uh, have heard of. Um, so this... This uh, site called Kidja Blue, Kidja is the name of the local Aboriginal people, is in the middle of the Kimberleys and um, basically had been dived, oh there's the map, so had been dived by one guy who lived up there, he took a single tank in there, he saw this from his own plane I think and then hired a helicopter, went in there, uh, did just a, a single tank air dive in the lake and thought it was so beautiful and so special that he, he swore he would never tell anyone about it. Fortunately, his niece was a local caver and over a period of about three years, she kind of got the information out of, out of him that there was a cave there and Paul went back and hired a plane and sort of mowed the lawn with this plane back and forth for about three days until on about the last 10 minutes of the last flight, he actually spotted the thing and whacked it in the GPS. So this uh, place is reached only by helicopters now. As I mentioned, as soon as you turn on the motor for a helicopter, you start paying and you get your wallet out and it's a very unpleasant business. So this was the first time we'd done any uh, helicopter diving and we were so frightened about how much it was going to cost that we decided to take the, the absolute bare necessities including you know, horrible freeze dried food and um, you know, no water and assumed we could drink the water and all this sort of stuff. That's a picture of the helicopter with a couple of big oxygen cylinders strapped to the side Vietnam style and uh, we camped there for about 11 days you know, doing it pretty rough but the most spectacular place and there's just no way we could have taken enough equipment and, and cylinders in there to dive this, this cave with open circuit. And as it turned out, the cave turned out to be magnificent and that's a shot from me hanging on the, the abseil rope into the entrance of the cave looking down into this big crescent shaped lake which is about 350 foot long, like your own private lap pool and truly glorious, glorious place to visit. 
lots of chambers within chambers underneath the thing and uh, quite a, a complex three-dimensional structure. But basically, uh, flowing down the hill, this thing is a, is a perched water table and it fills up in the wet season and then during the dry season it slowly leaches out the bottom down to a spring further down the hill, which you can see, where is it, the arrow that says approximate extent of deep cave passage just near there, there's a little wet soak where the water slowly comes out over the course of the dry season. Uh, so a very beautiful spot and the first experience we had with this sort of helicopter diving. Now once you've done helicopter cave diving, you, there's no going back, you're completely addicted. So uh, enter the Pierce Resurgence, our next helicopter diving project. Uh, now the Pierce Resurgence is a cave that I'm very tangled up with, I guess, emotionally and uh, certainly financially now after having started going there in 2007 with a, another uh, well-known Australian cave diver called David Appley, who did a huge amount of exploration in this cave. And uh, I was lucky that he invited me, or uh, I actually I invited myself to go with him, but that doesn't matter. And uh, so I went there in 2007. Now the Pierce Resurgence is in uh, an area known as the, um, the Mount Arthur Ranges on the South Island near Ernest Rutherford's uh, house in Nelson. And it's very famous for its very tall vertical caves, probably not tall by Bill Stone standards, but certainly tall for the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, there are caves that are up to a thousand metres now in vertical height. And uh, just around the corner from one of these caves called Nettlebed Cave is the Pierce Resurgence. And the whole place is, uh, is metamorphosed limestone that is um, marble and uh, freshwater Valclusian spring, which means it come, wells up from deep underground and it sits at about 300 metres ele elevation, and the only way to get in there is with a helicopter. So once again, we're looking at deep diving um, with open circuit, perhaps, which would mean a lot of gas. And it has been done, in fact, David Doulette and uh, Chris Brown did uh, an amazing expedition there for us and explored, gave down to over 120 metres, I think, on open circuit. But I think David would agree that, you know, the, the amount of time spent mixing gas and the amount of gas they would have had to take in was a little bit prohibitive prohibitive and certainly once we started to push past that 125 metre depth then I just don't think we could contemplate it on open circuit. The other big problem with this cave is not only was it becoming very deep but it's also very cold about 43 degrees Fahrenheit, six, 6 or so degrees Celsius and that's in the middle of summer. It probably doesn't get any colder in winter I don't know but it's certainly covered in snow everywhere else outside of the cave so we're not going there in winter. Well, the depth as of last January when we've just been there again is actually 221 metres, not 212, which I would suggest would be the, the deepest cold water cave uh, in the world at this stage. And the problems of diving deep in a cold water site like this are pretty self-explanatory, particularly with uh, issues uh, concerning CO2 and scrubber durations and all these sorts of problems. The top of the map is snipped off, I'm sorry, but it's virtually at the surface there. You, you dive into the entrance and down this uh, shaft, the main shaft there, down to about 105 metres, and then you turn right on that map and uh, go past what's uh, known as the big room. Uh, continues down the black line there to where you can see Rick Stanton's name. Uh, Rick was also on this trip in 2007 with Dave Appley and myself, and uh, Rick did this amazing dive on his homemade side mount rebreather down to 177 metres and tied off his line and only actually stopped at that point because uh, the primary light, uh, which belonged to me, uh, imploded and he had to uh, turn around and come out. Uh, I went back the next year and, and pushed down just a very short distance down to the next level there uh, at 182 metres. And then uh, with Craig Challen and some other guys uh, who have become collectively known as the Wet Mills, uh, which is our little team, they um, we've been going back to the cave and, and really trying to overcome the, the issue primarily of thermal protection in this site as the dive times have started to stretch out from three to four to five to seven to 10 to 12 hours in six degree water. And each year we've gone there, we've learned more and more about how to look after our thermal protection and uh, Pollock's talk this morning was obviously of great interest to me. And I can't wait for this aerogel stuff to appear and, uh, and put on a whole suit of it. But as I say, I think this would be an impossible quest now on open circuit to be considering these sorts of depths. As I mentioned, there's obviously enormous gas savings for long and deep dives, which reduces our expenses from the helicopter point of view. The, the warming and humidifying effects on the rebreather are enormous when you, for any reason, go off the rebreather onto open circuit. You feel the difference very rapidly indeed. It's quite unpleasant. Uh, the constant PO2 makes this 
much easier to do decompression calculations, particularly where you're not quite sure exactly what depth or time you're going to end up with. And uh, obviously the decompression is much more efficient uh, without those spikes that Simon showed on his graph this morning. In my mind, uh, I'm actually not, I wouldn't call myself a rebreather advocate. I actually prefer diving on open circuit side mount. Open circuit cave diving is my favourite kind of diving and I'm, I am a little fearful and certainly very suspicious of rebreathers, which is probably a good thing. But I'll tell you, when you're at depth or when you're in the overhead environment, it's extremely comforting having a rebreather, knowing that if a problem arises, you've got any amount of time to sort it, sort it out. So for me, that's the huge benefit for that technology. The other thing is just trying to mix gas between dives uh, in this environment. It, even with little three-litre rebreather bottles, it takes forever. So to do it with open circuit would be uh, unmanageable. Simon's mentioned the cost of helium in our part of the world. Um, I think, Simon, you might be paying retail there, mate, if you're paying $1,000 a bottle, because I think it's more like uh, three or 400 if, if, you know, if you know the bloke at BOC and Nelson, but, but certainly the retail price is over $900 a, a, a cylinder. So without going into the details here, to do the open circuit dive to 185 metres that we did one year, nearly $1,500 just for the helium for a single dive on open circuit, uh, the helium for uh, the rebreather dive, about $70 and it uh, doesn't include the savings on the helicopter, which are another few thousand if we had to take all the extra gas in. So there's no doubt that once you've paid off the loan on the rebreather, it starts to uh, put you in front. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit about the logistics of how we're doing the dives in this site. In the uh, top 40 metres of the cave, we've installed, or we, we each time we reinstall four habitats, which are just uh, the one cubic metre white transport uh, containers. We call them intermediate bulk containers. They're used for detergents and pesticides and stuff like that. So give them a good clean out, turn them upside down in the cave and uh, bolt them and rope, tie them with ropes to put them in the cave. So we've got four of them, one at 40 metres, one at 28, one at 16 and one at 7 metres. Part of those depths is just the logistics of where they fit in the cave. Uh, part is uh, some decompression planning in mind. We're now using rebreathers in pretty much each of those habitats. So after the push dive, we come back to the first habitat at 40 metres, take off our main unit, enter the 40 metre habitat and put on a, or rest on our lap, a strip down KISS rebreather. So the cylinders are taken off, uh, there's no wing or harness on it. Uh, we just rest it on our lap, put the, the loop on and the cylinders are on long hoses hung underneath the habitat. When it's time to move up to the next habitat, we go back in the water, um, clip the rebreather off to a, uh, a harness that we put on and then clip off the two cylinders and with a support diver at all times. That's a really important thing to emphasise with any sort of habitat manoeuvres uh, up to the next uh, habitat. And so on up to the 16 metre habitat where we're now using uh, what we call the Wet Mules Man Bag CCR but it's actually a rip off of uh, um, the thing called the uh, Next Generation Rebreather which many of you will have read about on rebreather the world. I'm sorry I can't uh, the inventor of that, but it's basically a beautiful little simple rebreather made from a gas mask bag. And uh, so we've adopted a couple of those for a uh, closed circuit rebreather for the deeper habitats and an oxygen rebreather for the shallow habitat. Now this is a very exciting video that I'll reenact now of the habitats. And uh, you're swimming down, you see the habitats with all the paraphernalia hanging below them. Uh, we've got surface supplied heating cables going down as far as uh, 50 metres and you can take those cables up with you all the way through the habitats and we have radios in the top two habitats to talk to the surface and we also have a buzzer box that Ken Smith invented for us that goes all the way down to 110 metres and at every 20 or 30 metres you can press the buzzer and alert the surface to the fact that you know, you're on your way up. It's particularly good for the surface to know when that first 110 metre buzzer goes off then we can start to quickly you know, make a decompression calculation. We know roughly where the push diver is and when we can expect him up at the 40 metre habitat, roughly. So that started to work really well for us. All these push dives are done solo um, for the main reason that uh, we feel that there's uh, absolutely no way you can assist a second diver in distress at those depths. So uh, feel it's much safer actually by, by yourself. It's all relative, I guess. So that's the oxygen rebreather. And as I say, many of you will recognise that it's not our design, but it works beautifully well. And we just clip that to the, a hook on the roof of the habitat and the loop just sits nicely in your mouth and it's very light and comfortable. And I heard uh, Martin Robson talking about habitats. The 
sitting in a habitat and breathing open circuit is dreadful because of the noise and the vibrations. It's really unpleasant. Sitting on your rebreather, you can be very comfortable. And that's the uh, man bag from 16 metres, which has uh, got a shear water HUD on it. And we use that as the primary and, and only uh, PO2 display, which is uh, heresy, I guess. But uh, it's very important that this is light and compact and just sits in your mouth with no fatigue. And I'm convinced that the decompression advantages of being warm and dry in a habitat are enormous. And in fact, in a, ser a, a tiny series, I guess, of about 15 or 16 dives between Craig and myself over 100, and, oh, sorry, and Dave and Sandy over 150 metres, we've not even had any niggles, which is certainly a lot better than our track record in the 100 to 120 metre range. Now, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is just spend a bit of time talking about planning bailout for these kind of dives, which is a real issue, obviously. And, and Craig and I spend hours and hours and hours arguing back and forth the pros and cons of all the different possibilities for doing deep bailout and it's worth this community just uh, thinking a little bit about um, deep, deep bailout options and pros and cons. We all accept that we need bailout and particularly uh, well for all dives full stop. Given the, the limited duration of open circuit depth uh, the, the idea of a second or bailout rebreather is a very attractive one and Craig has addressed this issue by twinning up his Megalodon rebreather and uh, thanks to Jacob from Gollum Gear, he's now got a twin off as well. So flick of the switch and he can go back and forth between one loop and the other loop. It's a huge device. I'll show you some photos in a minute. But once he's got it on, it's pretty comfortable and, and works very well for him. Go on to your second rebreather. If there's a problem with the first, you don't have to change your decompression planning. Um, you know, you can pretty much carry on as, uh, as normal. That's a, a photograph of his uh, dual bailout valve, which Again, looks complex and, and frightening, but it's actually a very simple device and, and beautifully designed and made. Now, the problem with bailout rebreathers is that, firstly, they need to work when they're required. They can't be flooded, and they have to have a breathable gas inside them. So that means that on the descent and during the dive, you have to do some kind of, have a system to check your second rebreather uh, throughout, the, throughout the dive. Now, that adds enormous complexity and task loading to an already stressful and difficult situation. So for those reasons, I've been a little bit nervous about embracing that, that technology. And I think having two rebreathers in a compact form on your back like Craig is is probably a way to go if you're going to go down that path. You certainly need to have dived that configuration many, many times to be very comfortable where everything is before you contemplate doing any sort of uh, deep diving. In fact, in this sort of environment, when you're in dry gloves and you're wearing very bulky and heavy undergarments, your, your uh, mobility is very restricted. Any tiny change to your gear configuration needs to be rehearsed and practiced in shallow water before you take it anywhere else. It's amazing how the tiniest changes, you know, one little hose or, or, or you know, hose routing or a minor thing can cause things to become a little unstuck when you suddenly realize you can't reach it or you don't know where it is or it's had some other implication. I've made this little matrix for the way I would, basically, I'd, this is about trying to win the argument with Craig, basically, and why I, I believe that open circuit bailout is a better option for these dives. Uh, and uh, the way I approach the concept is this, that um, I look at the, the likely possibilities of problems with the rebreather and uh, whether they would make me require to bail out off the primary rebreather. And then secondly, whether if I did bail out off the primary rebreather, whether the rebreather would actually do what it needs to do, that is, give me breathable gas in a way that I can return to the surface safely. So looking at the common reasons why people might think about bailing out, if uh, the primary loop floods, uh, first of all, I consider that to be a rare event. You know, it's an unlikely thing, although, yes, it does happen from time to time. Do you have to bail out if you flood your loop? Well, yes, I think you, you definitely do. And if you've got a bailout rebreather, would bailing out onto it in that scenario be a successful manoeuvre? Well, if the rebreather's working fine, then yes, uh, the second rebreather should be an option for bailout. Uh, the second problem is problem, problems with the electronics. Again, with reliable electronics that we now have, the chances of a, a problem arising underwater. I've certainly had plenty of electronics problems before I've jumped in the water, which have made me have to abandon the dive. But once you're underway, it seems pretty rare that electronics problems arise. But if they do, do you have to bail out? Well, it depends on the problem, I guess, but uh, usually you have some other options like going to a semi-closed mode or uh, uh, another way of managing the problem. But if you decided that you're unhappy and you wanted to bail out, 
well, the bailout rebreather, if it's working well, should uh, solve that dilemma for you. Uh, if there's a problem with the gas supply of any kind, if the oxygen fails or runs out, or there's a problem with the solenoid sticking open and it spikes, again, there are other options you can approach that problem with and you may not need to bail out, but if you do, the, rebreather, the other rebreather should be working. Now, when we start to look at CO2 problems, it's becoming a little less clear to me what, uh, what the answer is. Um, if you had a problem with the scrubber, for example, a packing problem, some breakthrough, or you'd exhausted the scrubber material and you developed a CO2 problem, first of all, it, the likelihood of that sort of thing happening in this cold water prolonged diving scenario is more than low, I think. In fact, we've had one or two minor CO2 incidents along this, these lines. Is, the, is bailing out mandatory? Well, yes, I feel it is mandatory to get off the loop. And if that happened, would the second rebreather solve the problem that you're, you're experiencing? Well, Craig is adamant that if he detects it early enough, then yes, the second loop will fix that problem. I'm slightly less convinced that uh, given early detection of you know, CO2 because you've sensed it yourself, going on to a second rebreather may still be causing you some duress. I think that open circuit is a better uh, option. Now, maybe that's just for a short period of time and then you can safely go on to the second loop and that's a reasonable approach. So I've put maybe there for that one because you can probably argue both ways. The big worry that we've all got about this diving and uh, anyone who's been fortunate enough to hear Simon talk about uh, the analysis of David Shaw's accident and this concept of uh, independent respiratory insufficiency will be aware that the deeper you go, the more likely this problem is that you yourself cannot clear CO2 from your body because of respiratory issues. And should that arise, A, yes, bailing out off the loop is mandatory, but going on to a second rebreather, I feel, and I think most people would agree, will definitely not solve the issue. Uh, you're, just change, you're changing the equipment, but the problem still resides within the diver. So I think that the only hope for resurrecting that problem, should you become you know, a long way into that vicious cycle of, uh, of difficulty breathing, <laughs> is that you need to get onto open circuit and hope that that will break that cycle and ascend from depth to decrease the gas density, which will also improve things. And then if things have settled down, yes, you can go back onto the loop. So I looked at this and I thought, well, the biggest thing I'm frightened of in these deep cave dives is this problem of respiratory in insufficiency. And I won't go into all the physiological details of that, obviously, now, but that was my greatest fear. And yet the bailout plan that we're talking about is a, a system that is not going to help in that, in that particular scenario. So I felt that I needed to stick with open circuit um, bailout. This is the other video I was going to show you, some nice video of me laying line at 200 metres, which is, uh, um, would have been nice, but the things in this video that I wanted to show you were a couple of problems. <coughs> Firstly, a significant HPNS was shaking hands and difficulty doing simple things like tying off this reel, deploying my knife to cut the line, and the audio actually, to my an anesthesiologist's ear tells me that there's a little bit of uh, the first hint of this uh, effort-induced respiratory failure. Sorry, effort-independent respiratory failure. That is, you can hear a pattern of respiration which is starting to head down that path. It's very, very subtle and very early, but you can certainly hear, you can certainly hear very loud banging closed of the uh, flapper valves in the mouthpiece, which you don't hear at shallower depths uh, from the uh, gas density. And you can also hear the occasional prolonged expiration and little grunt uh, at the start of each expiration. So you hear this sort of, <coughs> sort of noise, which is uh, just the start of this, this pattern that Simon's um, described so well. Anyway, that's for another day, I'm sorry. But it is, um, yeah, I'm happy to share that round for those who are interested. So just to finish up with a few pictures of uh, the breathers that we're using. Uh, so that's a picture of Craig's Megalodon from the back and the front. As you can see, it's a complex looking beast. And, you know, to help him dress into it, uh, I just look at it and go, well, where is all the bits that you need? But, you know, he's spent an enormous amount of time on this unit and is very, very comfortable on it indeed now, and it works very well for him. Now, uh, two of our other divers, uh, Sandy Varan and Dave Barty, are both uh, Revo divers, and they've approached the problem in a slightly uh, unique way by uh, putting an R2-D2 on the side of the unit. Uh, that's uh, an inspiration taken out of its box and, um, and clamped to the side uh, with a second loop sitting uh, around with two separate loops with uh, not a common bailout valve. And uh, they've successfully dived 
that uh, to 200 metres and uh, again it seems to work very well for them. Now of course I have to defend my position of uh, planning on doing open circuit bailout at uh, 200 metres which is not an easy problem to do and I'm not suggesting for a moment I've got it right but if you do the maths on this it's not very attractive at all in fact. Uh, if we look at an 11, 11 litre cylinder which we pump up to 250 bar for these dives, uh, we've got 240 bar cylinders. And if we assume, as someone said earlier, when you're having a crisis and you're actually planning to bail out, I normally plan for a, a swimming sack rate of, say, 20 litres per minute. I'm, I'm very confident it would be at least 40 litres per minute for a short period of time if it's all hitting the fan. So if you're breathing 40 litres per minute at uh, 21 atmospheres, it works out to roughly three minutes per cylinder uh, with a bit left over that you can't get out of the tank because you're too deep. So I'm carrying three, sometimes four cylinders for these dives and uh, the first one's plugged into the bailout valve so at least I've got that one for three minutes that, that's assuming the bailout reg works at that depth which I'm not going to test just for uh, experiment's sake. Gives me about 10 minutes to get back to the 150 metre stage tank which on the scooter takes about three minutes if you just go for it. So I'm not pretending there's any margin of safety there whatsoever but I do believe that it will give me an option in, in case of this respiratory insufficiency problem. We've tried staging rebreathers in the cave and they, um, we should have listened to Rick Stanton's advice in, in that he was correct in saying that uh, they always flood if you sit there um, and, and leave them switched off they just gradually flood and some uh, uh, you know, cave divers have recently found that out to their cost. So my unit is just a, a straightforward revo basically with um, the two 20 amp hour uh, light uh, battery packs on the sides which I plug into two bulkheads in my suit for my uh, heating garments and, and an argon cylinder on the, on the side which we are still persisting with despite minimal evidence for its uh, efficacy but I figure the placebo effect is as good as any effect if you're bloody cold so uh, we'll stick with that for a bit. Side mounted KISS which um, a friend of mine and I have have put together was my original bailout plan but um, as I say it, uh, I've, I've gone away from that idea. So I'm just going to finish up by uh, just talking a little bit about you know the future of rebreathers for this kind of diving. There's no doubt that rebreathers are going to become more efficient, more reliable, uh, better self-checks, uh, automatic bailout systems have been proposed. CO2 monitoring is obviously red hot at the moment improved reliability in, in oxygen sensors and maybe even some small improvements in work of breathing will be possible. So let's say we can build a rebreather that is completely diver proof. Of course none of that will help with this problem of deep diving, gas density and respiratory issues we face. So my feeling is we've probably reached or even actually passed considerably the safe limit of, of depth for rebreather diving. The, I think this is a US Navy study that was a uh, feasibility study into uh, a 2,000 foot rebreather which was published way back in the 70s and uh, a fan forced component to actually push gas through the rebreather to, him to decrease the work of breathing uh, was proposed and that's the only thing that I can think of which might improve the situation a little bit um, but this actual unit is a surface supplied apparatus I think feeding into the you know the, uh, the rebreather style uh, helmet and uh, you know very complex and uh, drive that motor for a period of time would require battery packs that we probably haven't got available but if any of the manufacturers are interested in building something like, like that for us we might uh, be able to put it to some use. I'm glad that Leon actually mentioned this in his uh, Reza talk because I've been slowly working my way around the room uh, harassing the manufacturers and also talking to, uh, you know, emailing people in the past about this, but as someone who's involved in uh, accident and fatality investigation uh, as part of my interest and my work, it's have some concerns about if a rebreather diver dies in South Australia, where I'm from, the first thing is that the South Australian Police Water Recovery Unit are going to get this rebreather and they know nothing about rebreathers whatsoever. So they're going to call someone like myself who has some experience with rebreathers to help them analyse the unit. Now if it's one of the couple of rebreathers I'm familiar with I may be able to do a half reasonable job at that but if it's one of the myriad units that I don't know anything about then there's a fair chance I'm going to make a mess of it. And uh, I know Martin Parker has uh, published a, an extremely detailed step-by-step -step 
paper on how to analyze a rebreather after an accident or a fatality. And it, uh, in the submarine trip that Andrew Fock and I were on in, in Turkey, uh, where there was a near fatal accident, we used that uh, paper to analyze the equipment and it was enormously helpful. So my request would be to reinforce what the research group is, is asking for is to preferably put in the public domain so that it's widely accessible for all the manufacturers to make a step-by-step -step analytical form so that uh, people out in the field can approach different units in a, in a sensible and comprehensive way without missing vital information. And that obviously benefits the rebreather community to work out what's gone wrong uh, and obviously benefits the manufacturers to avoid any false accusations of an equipment problem where most likely it's a diver error or if there is a fault uh, with the equipment then that becomes more widely known. So that would be my one safety message for my talk. And I think that is the end. Thank you very much for your patience.